Hello and welcome to everyone. Um, thank you for coming along to this session, which is entitled 20 Years in Learning Technology. We've got six former alt presidents here who are going to discuss what has changed over the last 20 years as far as learning technologies are concerned. So I'm going to hand you over to our speakers, who are Jonathan Darby, Stephen Brown, Jane Seal, Linda Creener, Jilly Salmon, and Martin Oliver. The idea for ALT was uh, born in uh, 92. Um, at that time, I was uh, directing something called the Computers in Teaching Initiative, uh, which was a short-term funded program uh, by government. Um, we were coming to the end of our three years of funding and we'd been reviewed and we had a sh fairly short extension. And as a result of the activities of the CTI and other uh, uh, programs like it, there was a distinct and identifiable community of people whose livelihoods were uh, dependent on learning technology or who, who were getting uh, funded to do something in that area. And we were very conscious, or I was very conscious, of the fact that our existence was at the whim of the, the funders. And it seemed really important to create something uh, that would uh, have a uh, lifespan of its own that would not be uh, dependent on this and also something that would be properly owned by the community and, and I put the idea to uh, the uh, staff of the uh, CTI centres um, and there wasn't great enthusiasm for it I have to say actually uh, but one thing led to another um, and uh, the thing that really helped get ALT going uh, was a chance encounter with someone from BT where I uh, said about this desire to set up an association but how difficult it was going to be without the ability to employ anybody. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I had a phone call from, from this person saying, you know what you were saying about an association for learning technology? Would £50,000 help you uh, get going? And I said, yes, it would. And uh, that was how that came to be. Um, Wendy yesterday uh, referred to the uh, launch of ALT. What, what we'd done before is I'd written to everybody I knew, uh, about 200 people who had some interest in the area, inviting them to become uh, founder members. And more than half of them did, which was an extraordinary response. And then we uh, formally launched it at the Cal Conference in 93. And what Wendy didn't say was that she came up and castigated me and the, the others who were involved in this and said, have you noticed something? You're all men. <laughs> and I lo looked uh, rather askance because I hadn't noticed and I felt mortified to have it drawn to my attention. So uh, uh, that was a good start from Wendy. Anyway, the conference in, in 94 was the first time, of course, when uh, the uh, people... Uh, involved got, got together and I looked up the, the programme and I saw my uh, opening address was what do we need learning technology for and I scratched my brain and hunted through a few old, old files uh, to try and figure out what it was I was uh, looking at and I realised what I'd been, uh, what I was doing at that point was uh, challenging the audience with a question and this question had wasn't completely new to me. I'd been at a conference uh, a little time earlier uh, run by Educom, uh, before it was Educause, and one of the keynote speakers there, uh, Louis Perlman, went uh, on at some length, uh, told a story about going to buy a new car. And in the car showroom, uh, the uh, person selling him the car said, and this model, sir, has headlamp washer wipers, to which... His reply was, and what is the problem to which headlamp washer wipers are the answer? And uh, answer came there, none. I have been obsessed with this, this question, and I think I asked it even then. What is the problem to which learning technology is the answer? And if you look at the evidence of the sessions that uh, took place in, in, in 94, and remember at this time, uh, this was pre-Google, 
Um, you won't find the word internet anywhere in this uh, book of abstract. You will find World Wide Web, you'll find information superhighway, you'll find a few things like that. What you did have was really quite good uh, tools uh, for uh, constructing uh, multimedia. You see a lot, of, a lot on multimedia and, and, and so on. And my conclusion at the time was that the honest answer to that was because it's there. People were using it because it was there. They were, they were also using it a bit because they got money under false pretenses. The Teaching and Learning Technology Programme had been launched, and this was uh, uh, predicated on the notion that it would be possible to substantially reduce the cost of delivering first-year courses in university by having a common core of technology-supported uh, courses. Well, I don't think anybody in TLTP seriously believed that was going to happen, but they were very happy to, to take the money and do something worthwhile with it. Um, so I now ask the question again in 2013, uh, what is the problem to which learning technology is the answer? Do we have a better uh, answer to this question, or a better question to this answer, I should say, than we, we had then? And I think there is some progress in this area, but perhaps not as much as you would have expected in, in, in 20 years. Um, we have uh, the developments, things like the OER University, which is trying to use technology to specifically answer the question of under provision in, in uh, work, global higher education, a, a big deficit there, and MOOCs likewise. Um, what you also have is a very considerable number of uh, small-scale examples of technology being used to address real problems, real issues. But the missing element is scaling up. We heard from the uh, Pro Vice-Chancellor uh, at the opening session for uh, Nottingham that still, some sort of 18 years after VLEs uh, first appeared, still have the situation here in uh, this university on whose campus we are, where uh, the VLE is used well by a small bunch of enthusiastic uh, uh, academics, but uh, in most cases it's just used as a dumping ground. So there are still many issues I think we face in terms of what is it that we really should be doing with this learning technology. Thank you. Okay, that was the early history. Now we roll forward 10 years um, but, um, to a period when uh, I think it would be fair to say that ALT was beginning to um, go through some kind of process of critical self-appraisal and, and analysis. But before I get into that, I thought it would be quite an interesting thing to do just to take a look at how the, uh, the association seemed to be viewing itself over the years. And, and a simple way, um, I thought, to try doing this would be to take the um, editorials that appeared in the association's journal and just stick them into Wordle and see what happened. This is the very first uh, editorial of the very first issue of the association's journal. And just look at the words. Yeah, what, what, what's really coming out here? What, what's this association about, these words? Oh, don't be shy. Look. Technology, MPC, PC, uh, Max. Um, it, 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 it's sound cards, television. This is this is the technology in the Association for Learning Technology, writ large before your very eyes, courtesy of Wordle. Um, learning's in there, mind you, over there on the right hand side. It's it's not too bad. Um, can I? Oh, I can control this. Wonderful. Um, roll on ten years. What have we got now? Uh, learning still in there. Uh, it's about the same size, but but the emphasis and, and, and video is there. It's pretty large as well. But can you see the emphasis is changing? Yeah, there's not so much technology. There's more stuff about people, stakeholders. Tremendous. Um, well, I think so. Um, and then if we roll on another ten years, this is where we are now. And I think that's a really striking transformation. Yeah, learning still about the same size. But uh, believe me, I did not doctor this. I just took the editorial, stuffed it into Wordle, pressed go, and that's what came out. So I think that says a lot about where we've come 
over the last 20 years. But let me just go back 10 years to where we were, so halfway between the beginning and where we are now. Um, I think we did some very clever things uh, in, in the early days uh, of old, some things which have, have done us a lot of good. We, we began as a, a small group within universities, um, a community of interest, a, a SIG, if you like, a kind of a SIG, but, but, but set up as, a, as an association with some funding. We took a decision to open up from higher education to include further education, to include schools, to include industry, and also to engage with government through commentary on um, government white papers, to, be, to become a, a, a player on a much broader stage than we, we were it, it, right at the very start. Um, I think that was, that, that was a good thing to do. Um, we've also set up the Seamalt scheme, which I also think is a good thing to do, um, it, because I think it's... If you take those things together, it's, it's building up the professional um, status of the association. I think we're on a kind of a trajectory. Um, whether, uh, w whether this is where we want to go to is something that I think that the members need to debate. But if you take um, what we've been doing and add it all together... Uh, that increasing professionalisation, establishing some kind of um, accreditation system for learning technologists, the way we're engaging with government in terms of policy issues and strategy and so on, we could be looking towards, maybe in the next 20 years, uh, some kind of a chartership status for the association. We would be the association for learning technology. In order to do that, we'd probably have to change just as much as we have over the last 20 years. But were we, were we to do that, uh, I, I for one think that would be a, uh, a really um, stunning achievement and um, I hope I'm still around to see it if it happens. So, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So um, you're listening to all the past presidents um, and we each have an agenda and we each have a different voice and I think um, it's important that you understand my voice and where I'm coming from. I'm, pro I'm a professor of inclusive education and in a sense voice and inclusion is really important to me. Um, so when I um, first encountered ALT was back in 1997 when I went to the Telford conference um, and then and now, I, if I was to label myself, I would label myself as a lecturer slash researcher. So as a lecturer slash researcher, the alt community back in 1997 welcomed me with open arms and it was all inclusive. And you've heard Stephen talk a bit about that in terms of who's in, um, that we welcome in schools, FE, universities, industry, etc., etc. Um, but I think what, what my um, kind of reflections are going to be about is in terms of what we've achieved and what the dangers are. I think we're coming to a point where we have to seriously think about um, what we're saying to people about who's in and who's out, whose voice is important and whose voice we're not listening to. So that's my kind of agenda, if you like. So thinking about ALT as a community, I'm talking less about learning technology, what's been achieved, but thinking about ALT as a community, the positive things in terms of voice for me, in, in terms of whose voice, um, is I think the association has achieved a great amount in terms of giving learning technologists a voice. Um, so in terms of professionalising a group of people who see it as their role to promote and support the use of technology technology in whatever institution they're working with and other precedents that you'll hear later on will talk more about that so I won't labour that point um, and so thinking about well what kind of voice if we know who's got a voice learning technologists and for me that's well, well I am, am I a learning technologist I don't know I don't have a role in supporting staff to use technology I'm not an educational developer I just use technology in my own practice am I in am I out I'm not I'm not sure I know about that, and I'll say a bit more about that in a sec. But what kind of voice um, do, we, do we have as an association, do learning technologists have, 
It's a growing political voice. I think another one of the great achievements of ALT is that it, it moved into trying to influence policy, have a voice in that wider funding and policy agenda. And so the committees and particularly the, the Board of Trustees have worked hard to make sure that you as a membership have a voice, have a say, respond to all the um, consultations that come out from governments and other bodies. And I think ALT is being taken seriously. Um, and you can follow that Google trail if you want in terms of what Alt has said at various points. So I think um, we as a group have a growing political voice and that's something really to, to cherish. Um, I also think we as a group have a literature informed in voice so that, voice, so that we um, are very capable of um, when we're talking about what we're doing in our own practice, we can link it in some way to what's been written um, in the field about what we've done. But I'll say a bit more about that on the not so positive side. What's not so positive then? Um, I've already started to give you some hints about that. I, I'm starting, I'm not saying that, that everything's gloomy, but I'm, I, what I want to forewarn us about as a group is... As we start to think about the future, I think we have to start to think about whose voice is being privileged in this association. And I am concerned about a move towards people like me, lecturers, who, are, who don't have a formal kind of institutional role in technology, kind of being pushed out a bit from having a voice in this association. And I'm starting to be a bit concerned about what I would call the othering of people like me, the othering of lecturers, where staff developers and others stand stand up on this stage and talk about these poor deficient lecturers who are so ignorant and stupid about technology that they need our help and we need to come in and rescue them. And, w and we problematise them and they become this deficient other. Um, and so I would just warn us as a group about, you know, are you happy? Do you, A, do you agree with me? And if you want to disagree, that would be great. Perhaps I'm just a bit too um, worried about that. But, you know, should we be worried about the othering of people like myself, lecturers, and perhaps those others that I've missed out there? What kind of voice is missing? Although I think as an association we have a literature-informed voice, my other concern is I actually believe we're very superficial about our engagement in literature, in research. And I think as an association we're in danger of not developing, growing, celebrating a really critically evaluative voice that kind of scratches underneath the surface of what we're doing. And I still think we're in this danger of, of the celebratory mode of what we do and not really being very critically evaluative. So my challenge for the future is think about who's in and who's out and do we care? Um, and think about what kind of voice you want. Um, yes, we want to influence people, but we want to influence people with authority and we'll have to think about how we do that. So thank you. That's my two penna. Right, well, what I would like to do is to reflect on three aspects of where learning technology has made a difference and where ALT has had a role in that. So to start off with, I'd like to look at it from an institutional perspective. And uh, then, back in 1993 or thereabouts, learning technology, as we've heard, was very much a niche area. And um, most of us were, who got involved around that time were in short-term contracts, we were in project funding. So there was lots of interest, lots of excitement, but it certainly wasn't mainstream. It was seen very much as a, a techie area. And uh, there's lots of acronyms there, which if, if you're old enough to remember them all, then, you know, <laughs> you've been around for a while. Um, and I think since then, thankfully, within institutions, learning technology is now of strategic importance. Within universities and colleges, most of us, I think, have learning teaching strategies, we have strategies which incorporate technology and focus on digital education. It's something that has become a high priority, uh, generally, for institutions. We have learning technology teams, we have permanent posts, we have budgets, we have career options. Again, ALT has clearly done a lot to promote learning technology as a profession and as a discipline. There are qualifications, there are master's programmes, there's also um, CMALT, of course, as we've heard. 
Um, I think another aspect for institutions to think about is the impact there has been in physical teaching spaces, perhaps not as much as we would have hoped. I think the main impact has been on um, learning centres and libraries. Perhaps the actual teaching spaces haven't changed as much as, as they could have, but uh, hopefully that will progress in future. So, have we seen transformation in institutions in the last 20 years? Not completely, but I think we're heading along the right road. Learning and teaching, central to what we do. So back then, the focus was very much on developing standalone content. I'm sure many of you will remember develop, developing computer-based learning materials um, aimed at individual students sitting at a PC working their way through these things. There was a huge novelty factor in the use of technology back then. Very few academic staff involved and they were just enthusiasts. Now, of course, digital content is everywhere. The problem for us is how to manage it, how to critique it, how to evaluate it and use it effectively. It's co-creation and collaboration rather than individuals working on their own. In, in the terms of the technology, of course, the VLE has become mainstream and very, very boring. We all hate it, really. The exciting part is still there, though, with the new things that have been coming on and will continue to come on stream in terms of technology. We now have many more academic staff involved, but the issue here is at what level? We still, I think, have very few academic staff who are really engaging in an exciting, innovative, interactive way in using technology. So there's still a big job for us to do with our academic staff and to keep ourselves up to date. So are we ahead of the curve in learning and teaching? No, we're not. We still have a long way to go. When you look at how technology has transformed other aspects of our lives, we're way behind when it comes to how it's transferred education, um, transformed education. And we've heard about that a few times over the last couple of days. Finally, looking at research, um, Back then, the focus was very much on evaluation. It was focused very much on how to usability factors. And again, the usability related to usually one student working at, with one um, package on one PC. And the evaluation was very much focused on the technology. Now, I think we have moved a bit more towards a theoretical basis. We have a lot of literature around now, which is helping us to inform uh, directions. I think um, uh, Jane has a point when she says we need to be more critically evaluative. Perhaps we're, we're still uh, a bit behind in that area. We tend to have more evidence-informed practice. We mostly, I hope, remember to think about pedagogical factors when we're looking at embedding technology. However, have we come of age as a discipline? I don't think we're quite there yet, although again, we are heading in that direction and we've made significant progress in 20 years. But I think we'll have to come back to that one next year, perhaps, on our 21st birthday. Thank you. Someone's ex-president's glasses still here that you wonder if you've been looking for. Um, I'd like to try and answer Jonathan's question. Um, these were printed out for me before I came on the 3D printer from our design school in Melbourne. Um, one won an award. This is for drinking beer out of. Fortunately, this is a miniature version. And this was um, a little figure from where you do an architectural drawing and then it's very easy to print it out. They were printed out in a matter of moments and the printer it was printed on probably costs about 2,000 Australian dollars, but reckon they're all going to have us in our homes in a couple of years. So if you'd have been shown that 20 years ago, what would you have said? You certainly would have started thinking, I'm certain about the learning and teaching applications. And that's what we all do, isn't it? You see something that is a bit of a novelty and start thinking, how can it help students? And I think that's the same then as it is now. So, you know, keep giving me the novelties, I think. Um, I want to take a slightly different tack. I'd, I'd just like to 
uh, remember Professor Robin Mason, who was very instrumental in the early days and throughout until her death a few years ago um, with Alt. Um, I believe that she had one of the first sort of what we'd now call learning technology PhDs in the world. And then she went on to supervise me and I got one of the soon to become after PhDs after that. And I'm sure there's loads of people now and with PhDs that have technology in them, perhaps almost any learning and teaching PhD would. So I think we are moving from that very early start to really looking at learning technology as a discipline. And I don't think it means that you have to have that kind of label. All of us are academics here and do have an academic and research base to what we do, even if our primary discipline is located elsewhere. Um, if you'd like to know more about Robin, if you don't know about her, I've put the URL up there. Um, and I also started thinking about kind of um, macro myopia in when you look back to look forward, you start thinking about all those incredible predictions, like when Jonathan said, well, it wasn't that easy to get it off the ground. I'm sure that's true. Um, and people are very sceptical. But actually, the longer term impacts are far greater um, than the myth of the short term impacts. And, you know, when we suddenly see something that catches media interest, such as MOOCs and all the other things that we've seen over the years. I think it's important to keep working at it, keep making it meaningful, keep providing the evidence. And, and I think ALT's a wonderful example of, of macro uh, myopia, really. Um, I started to think rather differently about 1993 and what was happening in the world at that time. You know, at the time ALT was established, it looked like a pretty interesting time. And almost everything where you can see the seed that was planted in 93. Um, also, you know, has had huge impact. You could look at the news, if you like, now and think about all kinds of things where you could track them all the way back during that time. So we do need to put our experience in the world and everything that's going on at that moment. Um, in Australia, people talk about the seventh wave. So not only have we got trends, we've also got things that are coming in from left field. The seventh wave is that really great wave that you're waiting for that, you know, will, when you're surfing. Um, and, and that's what we all need to look out for. Not only the trends and plod along, because everyone can do that, but as learning technologists, we're the people who can spot that seventh wave and do something more radical and more worthwhile for our students with it um, and it's pretty hidden you know I think you need to look at it and I think one of our roles for alt is actually to dig about and to dig it out rather than do what's kind of obvious or what the vice chancellor thinks we should do that day or what a technology provider I think we've got something special that we can do to try and work out whether you know it's a a, a black zebra with white stripes or a white zebra with black stripes. So I started to think about what else was going on around 1993. This was um, just before then Madonna did the uh, Blonde Ambition tour. Um, and she started wearing her underwear as outerwear. Um, and I think that's what we've got to do, really. So that's my invitation to you. Uh, <laughs> You know, she changed the world of underwear, and I think we need to change the world of learning technology. So congratulations. Wear your underwear with pride. Thank you. I think when we got the, the set of questions to prompt us about this, and one of the things we were told to do was think about what's been most surprising. And I think in many ways the most surprising thing is that all's still here. And if you think about the number of groups that have been started up and how many, of them, how many of them have lasted this long, this is a major achievement just that we've come here, that there are people in this room that were able to do this. So I think, you know, credit to everyone who's been involved in making that happen. That is quite incredible. The thing that, that struck me, um, you know, looking back over the 20 years is, is how some things have changed and things have stayed the same. And the terminology is one of these things. And you've seen the, the wordles that have come up. There's a lot of stuff which goes on where... To some extent, we're being told it's different every couple of years. 
There was a study I did with a colleague um, where we were interviewing staff who were moving their teaching online. And these interviews were really quite telling for me because the, the member of staff was saying things like, well, you know, it, it's transformed my teaching, but actually, you know, it's all pretty much the same. And we're trying to sort of get to the bottom of it. Well, you know, it can't be both things. What do you mean? And they explained that actually what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis were totally different. If they were facilitating a, facilitating a discussion, they were no longer looking at the audience to see who was busy doing their emails and who'd nodded off or, and who was actively talking and inviting people in who'd been quiet. They were going to the VLE and generating a list of participants and seeing who, who hadn't posted yet and emailing them. So at that level, there was no resemblance with what they'd done before. But at the level of values, at the level of what was important to them as a teacher, they were still facilitating learning. They were still encouraging people to participate. They were still contributing. And I think what we need to do is to start pulling out from this constant churn some of these more permanent things, some of these underlying features, some of the things which give the field stability and coherence. Because otherwise I do think we risk losing ourselves in this churn, the noise, and not actually seeing these patterns underneath it. We have done some incredible things, and it's been mentioned before, but I will bring home the point. This trajectory of the learning technologist, I mean, it started before ALT. You know, you can track things back a good 15, 20 years before ALT started. There were people called educational technologists working then. But we have given, collectively, a coherence and focus to that, which I think has been hugely important. But it's not stopped. I think one of the things that's interesting is um, you know, the current work that's being done with teaching administrators, where these are people who historically would not have been seen as learning technologists, but they're taking on these strategic roles in relation to supporting learners and are now gaining recognition. So, you know, we're not at a point where we have stability. We are still welcoming in more people. And I think one of the things ALT has done brilliantly is welcome. I think one of the things that's a challenge for ALT is what you do after you've welcomed all these people. You know, what happens after you've got CMOL? What happens after you've published in our journal? What happens after you've done a presentation here? And I think there is something which, going forward, would be quite important to do in terms of challenging those people we've welcomed in to take the next step, not just to sort of rest on their laurels, right, you've made it in, you know, isn't it nice here, but also to think about, well, okay, what are we going to do to up the game? What are we going to do next? Where are we going to go? I think one of the things... And this, this kind of ties into both those points, things we haven't done yet. I mean, one of the, I feel quite restless with this as a field. I think we've, we've achieved a lot, but there's so much more that we could and should do. We haven't saved the world. This quote from Diana is great. You know, education is on the brink of being transformed through technology, but it's been on that brink for some decades now. And I think there's a really important sense in which a session like this is actually, and like Wendy's keynote yesterday, it's hugely important to us as an association. We need to know our history. We need to know where we've come from. We need to know that bigger picture to make sense of our position in it all. I mean, this is a quote um, from an article by Terry Mays, who's one of ALT's ambassadors from just a couple of years after ALT was founded. People who've been involved with any length of time with educational technology recognize the experience of this cyclical failure to learn from the past. We're frequently excited by the promise of revolution in education through the implementation of technology. We see the technology today, we confidently expect to see its widespread effects of its implementation, but tomorrow never comes. And he talks about these previous cycles, and we can add now many cycles to this. You know, we're looking at tablets and MOOCs and so on. We have these things, we do see constant churn, constant revolution. But there is this question about, so what? Back to Jonathan's question, what is all this for? What, are we, what are we, can we stand back and say we've really achieved with this? So I think this for me is the sort of the opening out from a celebration of what we've done to the push to what we need to do next. I think we need to come to terms with this growing diversity in terms of ALT as a community, in terms of sectors, in terms of categories of staff, in terms of the international participation we're now seeing. We need to see that recognised in ALT structures and also find ways to, to build that in a, in a, into the rich and vibrant community in our structures as well as in terms of our welcoming people in. But I think we also need to do this moving out I mean, this idea that, you know, for example, um, lecturers need to know about technology, we, we kind of feel that they should come to us. We kind of feel that we're important enough and it's obvious enough that we have this expertise. Why aren't they asking us? But it's not so often we actually go and ask them, well, what are you doing? What can we learn from you? What is it you need to know? And I think there is this sense in which we have to be active in reaching out to other groups, other organisations, other people, other disciplines. Uh, Ed, uh, Neil Selwyn has characterised some of what happens in this field as an ed tech bubble. You know, we're very good at 
building our own work, but we can be a bit self-congratulatory about it. And his challenge is really, what can we do that then speaks back to the, the foundational discipline, disciplines that we can and should connect to, education, psychology, computer science, and so on. We should have things to say back to them that make them stop and think. Because if we can't do that, then you know, this question about what learning technology is for really starts to bite. So I think you know, a huge achievement to be here. You know, well done to all of us. But it's not done yet. I think we need to think now about where we go from here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.